You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. You may find all your sales and rental equipment needs at McAllister.com. We are pleased to announce our podcast is now a member of the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at AllIndianaPodcastNetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle and me at leadersandlegends.net. Thank you for joining us for part two of the Leaders and Legends podcast with NFL Hall of Famer, Super Bowl MVP, Larry Zonka from my Miami Dolphins. We are talking with NFL Hall of Famer, Larry Zonka, about his career and his new book, it's called Head On, a Memoir. Your book is is organized in a really terrific way where it's not just completely chronological. It kind of, it goes from, you know, a story about the NFL and then, you know, a story about something that happened as you were a kid. And I think it's a, a terrific way to organize the book because it, you never really sure what's coming next. I have all these notes for this podcast and I was trying to keep them halfway organized and I'm, I'm doing a relatively poor job of it. So forgive me for these things, not being in complete order. Uh, what do you think when you, you watch the NFL and you see the promo and it has all the running backs and there's number 39? Well, briefly, I'm, I appear there shortly, but uh, I'm delighted. Uh, you know, I, uh, who wouldn't be proud to be on the screen with the likes of the other folks that are there? I mean, uh, I, I made a living off my interior line. I was a power running back and pretty well defined. My running distance was from the tight end to the, the left the left side tackle on the opposite side. Uh, you know, I, somewhere in there between the two hole and the four, the zero hole and the four hole, the six <laughs> hole, maybe. <laughs> And that was that was it. Uh, you know, for me to be on that screen with the likes of the fellows that are on there, um, I'm very proud of that. And that was because I was with the team that I was with and not because I necessarily earned those accolades on my own. What was the best team you played against? Ooh. Week in, week out. I would say the Steelers were the the best team we played against because, and I picked them over over the Colts and uh, and and over the Raiders. Uh, it's a slim margin, but I, I would go with the Steelers because the Steelers were such such competitors, and this is why they had a mirrored image of ourselves. Their head coach had been an assistant coach with yeah. Shula. Yeah, so sure when we played them, we were playing the mirrored image of ourselves. Their numbering system was the same. Everything lined up. You knew, you know, uh, it, it was it was a double jeopardy situation because you had to really think in almost two dimensions. Because when you line up a certain way, they're going to realize that, and they know what that can that, what that means because they have the same numbering system and and same organizational standards. So it made it like playing in a mirror sometimes. The 1972 season was almost derailed when Bob Greasy broke his ankle, I think against the Chargers, maybe week five. Did yeah, there was a defensive end that did that for him. He didn't have to do it himself. He, uh, <laughs> heard, I'll tell you something, it wasn't his ankle. It was the, the bone up in his leg that I heard snap. You know, he had several injuries where, you know, there's several places where there was breaks and uh, it was a uh, well. I put it in the book. It was, that was the most sickening 
situation that I've ever bore witness to on a field because Bob was uh, absolutely uh, the core of our offense. And to have him uh, injured where you heard the bone break, you know, back any time before a minimum of uh, two months. Well, that's early in the season, but even if he can make it back in time for the playoffs, will we be in the playoffs without him? Because this is before they had little radios in their ears and they're talking to the computer upstairs and the, the offensive coordinator, and he's got a full layout and a computer dash before him. And he's relating what the best down and distance play is for this defense at this time uh, due to the computer. That wasn't there. Bob had to remember and 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 coordinate that and have the entire offensive uh, um, play selection for this game in his head and see it. And Bob was excellent at that. Now comes Earl Morrill comes out, walks into the huddle. He looks right at me and says, what do you think, Zonk? I said, it doesn't make a shit what I think. What do you think? <laughs> you know, have you been aware of all this? Now, see, I'm, I'm not – at that moment, I wasn't thinking clearly because Earl had played at Baltimore for Shula, you know, and been through the wars with Shula, and he knew that system frontwards and backwards. You couldn't have asked for a better backup. You know, you got to think about the scholastic side of it. He knew that offense, that numbering system. He knew the alignments. He knew what to do against the other team's defenses with that with that with that alignment of offensive players, and had been schooled pretty pretty well going down through the first uh, through the preseason and the first two or three games. You know, Earl was very studious. He was right in there, a good backup quarterback because he paid attention in the meetings, mm -hmm. wrote things down, questioned things. He's at it. He wasn't just going through the motions. He was for real. And when I said it doesn't make a shit, well, I think he said, no, no. What play do you like? And I said, ride 34. They're taking an inside approach and we can run it all day. And we did. We ran it like three to five times in the next quarter because that's the way Earl was. He would come to your back, come to the backs, come to the receivers in between plays and say, what do you like? You, you, are you getting a read? Do you have something? Is there a weakness that I'm not seeing? And you, you, Spill your guts to him right there as you're walking up to the huddle. And then he'd think about it. Maybe not right then, but a couple plays down the road, he'd, he'd use that. Warfield communicated beautifully with him. Not that Greasy didn't, but Bob Greasy had memorized the game plan. He was a walking um, walking encyclopedia, you know, down in distance would click things up on him. And he wasn't, he didn't favor the running game, didn't favor the passing game, you know, that much. He was well balanced with it. And we are appreciative to have him. But when Earl got in there, Earl wanted to know everybody's opinion. Bob didn't ask too much. So that was that was a big difference. Do you believe the 1972 Dolphins team and its accomplishment of being 17 and zero is underrated? And it seems that most of the coverage about the achievement is is almost scornful because of the old men who pop champagne. And I read the articles about it, and I'm like going, you know, when 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 the accolades are thrown teams way because you know they win two extra games that they didn't win the year before, and then you have a team that goes 17 and 0. Leaving aside the fact that I believe the Dolphins were three point underdogs to the Redskins. Yep. In Super Bowl seven, is it an underrated or underappreciated accomplishment? I think it, it could be in some respects. Uh, there's some credence to what you say. There's some sound. But the fact that the NFL put together that selection committee and and got and it took a long time and they, they honed it all down and, and said and came out and said, there's one team that was perfect. One team that's on the mountaintop. They recognize that officially. When that happened, I'm not going to argue with anyone that, you know, just a, a, a finite thing happens here or there changes that. I'm not, I'm not, but the fact that it happened suggests that one time when the team that should do that got up there, it did happen, but only one time in 50 years. Think about that. You know, that's people argue, well, if you wouldn't have had that penalty, if that flag wouldn't have flown in this game or that game, yeah, that's sour grapes. Flags fly all the time. What you do after the flag is what counts. And it, so that 
to, to say if this happens or that happens, this happened and that happened and we rectified it and we, we turned it into a win. And I say we, when I say we, I mean we, not just the starting 11 on offense or the starting 11 on defense. You got guys that handle the ball, they're always featured. I'm one of them. But there's everybody. It took everybody. I alluded to before, Charlie Babb, different people that stepped forward. Larry Seipel stepped forward. On that play, made the difference. And yes, sometimes a penalty flew, and that was the difference in us winning and losing, perhaps. But it flew. It was there. There must have been some credence to it because it was there. It happened. But here's my point. Only one time in 50 years has there been a team that paid that much attention to the finite details that cared that much, just like when Paul Warfield looked at me and said, thanks, Zonk. thanks for hitting that yeah. corner. I'm going to screw him in the ground on this play. That's what I'm talking about. That's that moment. He could have just said, oh, good hit, Zonk, and went back. But when he thanked me for it, see, that's the class. That's the pride of Paul Warfield. He, he he's such a class guy. He didn't beat me on the back and then he come with. He said, "Thanks, Unc. You know, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take what you did and I'm going to screw this guy in the ground because of it." That's when the realization. See, that's what teamwork. That's what that winning edge that Shula was talking about. That finite stuff that that made the difference in the stretch. And uh, you know, lots of teams came close but nobody got it. And whether the flag flew or Greasy's leg broke, whatever it happened, it was the right combination of events that were, were met with the intensity to perform. And that that performance was spurred by Shula's intensity with his foot in our butt to make us perform. <laughs> that was the difference of getting up the hill. That's the difference of being on top of the mountain and standing one step off to the side. Might as well be the universe. Let me ask you two other quick questions as it relates to the perfect season. One, before I read your book, I did not realize about your relationship about with, excuse me, your relationship with Tom Coughlin, <laughs> the coach of the team that beat the 18 and O Patriots. A, what was, was it like watching that game? And B, how soon after the game did you get to talk to Coach Coughlin? <laughs> I can't tell you what it was like watching that game. I was nearly incoherent several times. I jumped up and almost jumped into a ceiling fan when <laughs> Irie caught that football on the side of his head. I went up and stuck my head in the fan in the outside building that we were watching. The, we have a big, big screen TV out there, and we had a lot of people over, and we were watching the game. And I was beside myself, and I jumped so high, I hit the blades in the fan. <laughs> anyway, it's a long story. But <laughs> Coughlin, Tom Coughlin, and I go back to 1964 at Syracuse as uh, running backs coming in to uh, play for Coach Schwarzwalder at Syracuse on scholarship. Tom uh, comes, comes from Waterloo, New York. I was out west of him in Ohio and used to hitchhike up Interstate 90 and come in with Tom, and we would uh, – you know, get in there and, and uh, first, I never forget, when we got an elevator the first day, we're going down to the bus and Tom looked at me and said, uh, I'm Tom Coughlin, what's your name? And I shook his hand, said, Larry Zonka. He said, uh, are you defensive end? I said, no, I'm fullback. <laughs> he went, you're a running back? <laughs> Tom was about 210 at the time or 212, I don't know. He's a halfback. And I was a fullback and I was probably 240 at the time. And uh he, uh, he shook his head and said, us oh, might be a long haul here. And But Tom was a wingback, and he played uh, played a lot of football with me through the course of the four years we spent together. Got to know him and his wife very well. As a matter of fact, I went home and married my childhood sweetheart, brought her back, and that started, uh, moved into, or was going to move into married student housing, but got a job on the side and started working and had an apartment on the side. And Ben Schwarzhalder, who was dead set against marriage for his players started to realize that there was a lot less discipline problems with some of his players when they were married than when they weren't and decided to take a new attitude towards that. And Tom went home and married his childhood sweetheart, uh, Judy and brought her back. And, uh, they've been together ever since. And, uh, well, it's just a, it's just a, a very ongoing 
Tom, uh, uh, you know, he came to several places, came to Jacksonville right after I was up there with the USFL and, uh, you know, yeah. his brush shoulders quite a many, very, very often and always stay in touch. And he has one, like Shula, uh, if Tom Coughlin tells you something straight on, you know, gives you the, the nod and says, that's the way it's going to be. That's the way it's going to be. He's a man of integrity, just like Shula, uh, Shula was. And uh, I have the utmost respect for him. It's been a long, long, long relationship. And I called him immediately after that game and said, Tom, I owe you dinner. He said, you don't owe me anything, but I'd love to have dinner. <laughs> There's another famous uh, game as it relates to kind of, uh, obliquely to the Dolphins' 1972 undefeated season, and that is, I believe the game was in December, maybe December 2nd, 1985, in the Orange Bowl, the Miami Dolphins versus the Chicago Bears. And I remember watching it as a as a teenager, and the Bears were, I think, were 12 and 0. And had that amazing defense. And a lot of people said it was the best team of all time or was going to be. And I remember distinctly uh, Monday night football with the footage of you and kick and other members of the 72 undefeated team on the sidelines, bringing good luck, good luck to Dan Marino and that team. And Marino really picked them apart. Just a brilliant game by the Dolphins, but Marino particularly a what do you think of that game? Like being on the field, did you think, well, the Dolphins don't have a chance in hell? And and if, if you don't mind, maybe talk about how Shula reached out to his former players and said, hey, we need your help. He did. We did. How much of a part we played, I, I, I don't know. But I think if there was ever the power of – brain power all being on the same issuing the same wavelength um it, it came about if there's any witchcraft to be had good or bad <laughs> i think i think it crops up in that game because we literally wished them into uh in a defeat and that uh you know i think uh chicago was obviously a very fine football team and had been honed and um uh, but they didn't have their eye on the details and it was obvious uh, early in that game that it was it was it was a good game and it was it was close. But it, it, early in that game, it was it was obvious that uh, perhaps by the fact that some of the '72 team was there, and I'll, I'll just say this for what it's worth. This is my opinion. I think that team, the Dolphins team, that day played a little better than it had in some time. I think they played uh, like they cared. I think they were all in tune with it. And for just a moment, there was a little 72 magic that might have been there on the sidelines. Shula had a lot to do with that. Obviously, Marino, the people that were on that field, really wanted. They were inspired by the fact that we came there and, and were looking to them to help us. And I think that made a little bit of a difference. I think when you play away, it's it's doubly tough. And I, in Chicago's defense, that was a situation where Miami didn't look that good. Their defense they thought they could handle Marino, handle the, the offense. And uh, sometimes that fact that you think you have it won when you don't turns out to be the thing that defeats you. And I think that's what happened that day. We have a few more minutes with NFL Hall of Famer Larry Zonka. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago about the NFL's vote and that the Miami Dolphins 1972 is the greatest accomplishment in NFL history. Uh, but about 20, maybe, maybe 30 years ago, NFL Films did a computer simulation that had the Dolphins, the 72 Dolphins, losing to the Pittsburgh Steelers of the mid-70s in a in a simulated game that Mr. Zonka took issue with so much so that he told Steve Sable I'm coming for you or I'm looking for you and your former teammate Jim Mandich when asked if you were kidding and said I don't really know did that really make you upset I did not understand why anyone would want to put um, 
a blemish based on unreality on the 72 team. And for that, I uh, I got a little hot under the collar. I just, you know, if you were a competitor and you played against the 72 team and there was a flag thrown or there was a call that was made that made the difference in your opinion, I understand that. And that is valid. But to put up a fictitious scenario and then show where it it could, you know, to to try to try to wipe mud on somebody's windshield, <clears throat> in my opinion, just to screw with them. <clears throat> You're asking for a, a knuckle sandwich in the mouth. And at that point, I would have been happy to give one because it made no sense to do that. Why, why do you want to, why do you want to throw mud on the windshield? You know, if it happened, it's documented. We didn't, uh, we didn't dodge anybody. We didn't cut any corners. We did it. Barely. Yes. Barely. Slimly. Almost down to a paper thin. Yes. I don't argue with that. But so what? That, that little bit of difference in being perfect and being almost perfect can be a sixteenth, a micro inch, or it could be the universe, because it doesn't matter. One is itself and the other is not. So whether it's a mile or an inch, it's this, it doesn't make any difference. But then to brace something up fictitiously and throw mud on it, I don't understand that. You know, you might not have to adhere to it. You might say, well, it was close and that makes it so it's not that. Okay. So you see the difference as a quarter inch. I see this difference as the universe, but that's personal. That's who wants to look at it. But to purposely try to demean it by saying someone else was better because that sucks in my opinion. And I'll, I'll fight in a minute over that. <laughs> Did you get a chance to talk to Steve Sable about it? No. <laughs> Probably a wise move on behalf of Mr. Uh, Sable. Very wise move, yeah. The only time would, I can remember. What would, you, what, what would stimulate you to do that? <laughs> That's my Jim question. Bandage was like legit. He's like, I think he was joking, but I'm not sh- sure. Referring to you uh, wanting to wring a neck well, or two. Sable lived a long life, so he's fine. <laughs> uh, I only remember crying one time as a kid when any of my sports teams lost and Notre Dame football or IU basketball or Cincinnati Reds, I had a great seventies Miami dolphins, of course. And that was the divisional playoff game against the Oakland Raiders uh, dubbed the sea of hands game. I simply mm-hmm. couldn't a, I couldn't believe Vern didn't hurt her. Didn't sack Stabler. I couldn't believe Stabler floated that horrible pass into uh, the Dolphins secretary. I couldn't believe Clarence Davis, who I think caught seven passes his whole career, caught the ball, and that the Dolphins Dolphins dynasty, quote-unquote, ended. And there's a quote, I love it, from um, Jim Mandich, who said that the, the, the specialness had ended, the special, the special time, the special group of people, and it was over. You were you and Kick and Warfield were going to the WFL, and and the Steeler dynasty was coming into being. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit for just a second about what you thought as you were walking off the field and in Oakland? You knew you were going to the WFL, so you were leaving. Um, but just that the that game that ended so incredibly. I'm going to say tragically because I'm a Dolphins fan, but just emotionally and, and epically. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, it was the other side of the coin. Um, remember the Steelers we were talking about, you know, hollering turn around on the ball field. Uh, it was our turn to bite the bullet. It, uh, Luckily, it didn't come during the uh, undefeated season. It came right at the end. It would have been glorious to, you know, if that that ball gets knocked down, we win the game, we go on, and I don't think anybody else in the playoffs would have stood up to us. Uh, I think the Steelers and us were the two best teams that year in the NFL. But that's my opinion. I'm sure other people argue that. But there it was, and uh, it happened. Now, Walking off that field, I had I hated to leave that way. I wanted to go out on a higher key, as anyone would. Egotistically, all of us want to go out, you know, wearing the crown. 
but just to lose it by just a, you know, that was, uh, we knew about that because we had been on the other side of that, you know, in 72, right. several times. That's what we alluded to earlier in the conversation. So it was a long ride home. But on that ride home, again, I'll give you a reference to a guy that had uh, had much more class than most people thought. Don Shula walked around that airplane on the way back. We had a long flight back from Oakland and shook hands with everybody and thanked us individually for a great run. Thanked us for doing what he asked us to do. Not that we didn't bitch and moan, and I was one of the loudest bitchers and moaners. <laughs> but at the same time, same time, we did what he wanted us to do on the practice field, being alert, being into the game, caring about what our defense was doing, our defense caring about what the offense was doing, special teams being supported by both coaches and assistant coaches that were literally on the field, running back and forth, intensity. He thanked us for that intensity from 70 all the way to 70, 74 there. And it, uh, it made the difference too bad that that tiger that we always had win on that final thing, that little bit that we always mm -hmm. had come through that tiger turned on us at the end and bit us. That's the way, that's the way it happens. That's the way the snow falls, you know, but when Shula came and said, shook my hand and he said, I'm going to tell you something. I, he said, I appreciate it. Keep it between us. I said, what's that coach? <clears throat> he said, uh, I understand what you did and why you did it. He said, uh, you know, he pretty much gave me the nod that he understood why I did what I did and why we, we left and went and followed the route of the money. He, uh, he said, I'd appreciate if we keep that between us. And I did and upon his, uh, you know, I put that in the book because after his demise, I don't, I think it just shows what a class guy he was. He, uh, he was very sad that we were leaving, but he understood. And still what he was saying there was he still respected us for our decision. And he was pleased that I, that we poured ourselves into that final season even though it came up one play short, we were right. there, we were still going. And he appreciated that. And there was a moment there when I shook his hand and left. And uh, that's why, that's why I wanted to come back. And I finally made it back towards the end. I just got to play there and suffered another loss at the hands of Pittsburgh between Oakland and Pittsburgh, you know, <laughs> were you I hoping to get Dallas Oakland. in a Super Bowl? Were yeah. Hoping, like well, maybe we want Dallas you know, to come through. <laughs> Landry, he was quite a guy, and uh, what was that big defensive tackle there? Bob oh, Lilly. Bob Lilly. I see him Jeff at the Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, my goodness, <laughs> my they had a yeah, the list goes on and on. But Bob Lilly, I he came up to me one time and just started talking and shook hands, and we got to bullshitting at the Hall of Fame, which is a great place. I mean, you know, I'm, oh, I believe I can only imagine. I just we go up there and said, I said with Curly Culp and Willie Lanier, different people. And uh, that I just went head to head and we knocked each other silly where we couldn't walk, you know, <laughs> now to sit there and start telling stories on each other. It's just hilarious. And Bob Lilly came up to me and sat down next to me and we talked for about two hours on stop and laughed. And he said, you know, I could barely I told him, Bob, I appreciate your humility. I appreciate that you're a class guy, but you knocked me on my ass and you took the football. <laughs> I said, nobody's <laughs> ever done that to me before, but I said, you did it, Lily. I said, Joe Green came close, but you did it. <laughs> he kind of grinned and looked at the floor. But that's the kind of thing that goes on at the at the hall when you get there and you sit and you sit off to the side and they got all the ceremony going on but the guys get together and start talking and if you could record those side conversations and then go back and plant those into the footage at the moment it happened <laughs> oh, you know, it's wild do you take a lot of pride in the fact that these defensive hall of famers and I, I only know this because of being addicted to Larry Zonka videos on YouTube, that these these defensive Hall of Famers, like you're almost the standard for the toughest person on the offensive side of the ball that they encountered in their careers. 
I think he, <laughs> I, I was tough for a running back, but you got to understand that offensive and defensive linemen, linebackers, <laughs> and some tight ends are some of the toughest people. They hit, my goodness, they hit, they play to play, <laughs> you know, uh, um, to be accepted into that realm. You know, you're talking about the guys that hit the beach first. All right. Yes, sir. They're, they're a different, you know what I'm talking about. If you've been in the military, you know about the guys that are first. They're laying down the, the pathway or taking the hill. You know, they're, they're tunnel vision. To be included in that pack and then be singled out because I was the tough one. I became tough when my offensive lineman had softened up the defensive lineman so I could so I could work on a linebacker, I could work on a defensive back. Uh, or work on a defensive lineman that was already had a 280 pound offensive lineman <laughs> knocking him sideways. All right. And I could look real good running in there, knocking him down with my shoulder, but he had already been knocked sideways by one of my offensive Kuchenberg or Langer or little. <laughs> See, it's all relative and relevant to, to how it fits together. And that's what I talked to you about, you know, Paul Warfield coming and saying, thanks, Unc. in that moment, I realized how it all interlaces. We're all dependent on each other. And it, to, to glorify one position because it happens to be carrying the ball and the cameras on it, that's that's for the media and that's for the crowd. And they love it, you know. But to understand the inner workings of a power running game and how intricate it gets and how just like uh, Paige putting his hand down and giving something away, what a monumental mistake that is, particularly in a, in a Super Bowl you know, and how that can be capitalized upon because the team that recognizes it and sees it is intelligent enough to use it and, and incorporate it together and all understand it and work together to make it happen. You know, he spotted it, related it. We worked out a plan to check off and utilize it. All that is teamwork. That's what we're talking about. That's how important that teamwork is. If you have it, you've got a shot at the championship. If you don't have it, you'll be lucky to stay to make the playoffs. Who did you hit harder? Pat Fisher in Super Bowl seven, the Redskins defensive back, or I don't know, I'm gonna get this name right. The Buffalo Bills, John Pitts, where you became the first, if not the only, running back to be called for unnecessary roughness on a tackler. Because well, you hit the living hell out of Pat Fisher in the Super Bowl. Yes, because he had tackled me two or three. Well, I shouldn't say tackled me. He knocked me down a couple of times because I tripped over him. Because now when I say I tripped over him, that, that makes it sound like it was my mistake. It wasn't my mistake. Pat <laughs> Fisher has body control like a guy we had named Jake Scott, who was a defensive back for us. He was quick, beyond quick. He was... Uh, he wasn't fast, but he was quick. He would come up and set you up high like he was going to hit you or come in head on onto you, and at the last second, he'd take your feet. Most big men that run with a lot of momentum, fullbacks that lean way forward, their feet are back. When their feet are back behind them, they become on a, on a, on a slant, a serious degree slant. If you take their feet, if you fake them high and take their feet, you'll knock them down. Pat Fisher did that to me. Jake Scott did it to Riggins, uh, several. Uh, I saw him do it to Franco. Mm -hmm. It's it's the it's how intelligent. And Fisher wasn't that big <laughs> for Pat. He was he, he wasn't all that big. And, uh, he uh, he Car didn't want to take tackler though. Well, he, a tackler. But he's just smart. See what I'm getting at? He's he's a smart tackler. He knew my mm -hmm. feet were the most vulnerable part of me. He didn't want to take on my my shoulder, you know, my trunk. He didn't he didn't want to get hit with 245 pounds of momentum. He wanted to take my feet because he knew if I got my gets my feet out, my momentum will take me to the ground. And he did that two or three times before I got a chance to lay it on him a little bit. So it was tit for tat. <laughs> and the other guy, you know, we never did like each other. And that, uh, you know, there one that was just. That was payback, you know. That was back and forth, and that's uh, to get that penalty. I, I was, uh, it, it, that was right. I should have been called. It was, 
I, I didn't really mean to throw it the way I threw it and the way it ended up versus how what I intended to do was hit him in the side of the head. But it it ended up, well, it ended up a lot worse. But at any rate, that. Uh, and your coach was very happy. And then your coach was very <laughs> unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> he was never real happy when I came off the field with a 15-yard penalty. <laughs> <laughs> Once when I got hit in the back when Roy Winston hit me at Minnesota. In uh, oh, the, the 72 season. season. Brutal. Yeah, he about broke me in half. I thought he broke, burst my kidney. My gosh, he threw a ball a little bit high, and I reached up for it, figuring that Winston was going for it. Instead, he took the took the route, hit me in the back. Just, I thought he, I really, I thought I had an organ it's buster. Vicious. <laughs> broken bones. I came gimping over to the edge and laid down and Bob Lundy was ripping my shirt, my Jersey up and was trying to look to see if I had any ribs sticking out. And uh, Shula comes running up, bends down over me. Now this is knowing your players and looks me right in the face as I'm looking up, trying to tell Bob Lundy where, you know, where the, the petrifying pains at <laughs> it shouts in my face. You can't be hurt. And it, pissed me off so bad <laughs> that he shouted in my face that I went to grab for him. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm glad I didn't connect. <laughs> I'd have been blocking for OJ the next week, but I went to grab him. He took off and I jumped up. When I jumped up, I felt better. And Lundy started, our trainer started rubbing my side and it, you know, I, I, you know, it, I came away from it. But I'll tell you a funny story about that. I, I got to include this because Roy Winston, you know, he he was uh, the fourth linebacker for the Minnesota Vikings, and he's a hell of a player. Play, I think LSU, great great ball player, and uh, he was getting in that game on that cir circumstance, and he saw an opportunity. He did not know that the ball had been thrown real high. He just saw me coming, and he put he ran and put his head down and hit me. So when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, they said, make a list of the players, other teams you would like to be have invited. So I put Roy Winston's name down there. <laughs> oh, invited, that's great. Invited him to the Hall of Fame. And he came. And, uh, you know, I don't know Roy. I didn't know him at all. I just on the field there. And that exchange there was not a pleasant one <laughs> for either of us. His neck still bothered him. <laughs> anyway, I... Uh, when he came to the Hall of Fame for my induction, I went down to him and the and, and he, or I ran into him on the buses going over to the the hall from the hotel. And my brother Joe was sitting there talking to him, and I walked up and and uh, my brother said, "Larry, he said I want to meet I want you to meet the guy that almost put you out of football, this <laughs> Roy Winston." And I said, "Yeah, I know who." It is. And Roy looked really funny, like he wasn't sure exactly how to handle that, you know, which he wouldn't be in that scenario. Sure. As I shook his hand, I looked at him and I winked and I said, I'd have done it to you in a second. And he, then he got a big smile on his face. <laughs> and I, started, I slapped him on the shoulder and said, Roy, we, we ain't nothing but friends. You know, that's what uh, that's what guys that played the game full heartedly. That's Roy Winston was one of those guys. Uh Charlie Toller from Houston. The list goes on and on. You name hundreds of them. Jimmy Taylor. Uh, uh, Willie Lanier, guys that when you go to the Hall of Fame and sit down with them and start talking, man, they got they got stories just the way I'm throwing all this stuff out and talking about it. It's so rewarding to hear their stories and how close they came this time and how they made it that time. But, you know, this time fell through and and hear all their stories and then relate to it. I, I like to go back to the Hall of Fame, not so much for the ceremony and all the pomp and the, the celebration. But I love to see the other players. It's great to sit there and just tell stories from 40 or 50 or 60 yeah. years ago. I would, I, would, I would give mountains of money to the charity of your choice just to be your water boy at the uh, your towel boy at the Hall of Fame. Uh, you've mentioned uh, you've mentioned their names a few times. So I want to bring up, ask you a question, which I think I'm going to know the answer. So forgive me if I don't. Uh, when you when you are in the shower or driving by yourself and you're thinking about your career, obviously Super Bowl seven, a 14 to seven victory over the Redskins comes up as does the 24 seven victory over my brother, Michael's Miami Dolphins. I have to throw, or excuse me, Minnesota Vikings. I have to throw that in there. But when you think of other games is the Larry Zonka birthday, Christmas day game against 
the Kansas City Chiefs, which is still the longest game in NFL history. Is that the one you think of next, or are there some others that that enter your mind? When you start talking about teamwork and believing in yourself, I think that is the game where we made turn the corner, where we became the team that just was not going to be denied that the winning edge theory that Shula brought forward, that's when it started to to pay dividends. That's when it started to happen, that we almost willed ourselves in the overtime and overtime. If you look, there's a picture when Gary your premium kicks that field goal. There's a picture and I'm standing there and my arms are down at my sides and my head's up in the air. And there's Kansas City guy standing beside me looking the same way. That's because we were so tired so worn out that we were glad, number one, all of us on that field were glad that it was over. Half of us <laughs> were happy that we won. The other half was a little sad, but still glad that it was over. <laughs> and that the way my way I'm my body is in that picture, you can tell I'm just worn out. I went into the locker room, the reporters, everything came in. I went and got a shower, came out, put my clothes on, stood up, buckled my pants, and turned around and talked to the reporters. And my pants, after they buckled, as tight as I, you know, just like I wore them in, they mm-hmm. fell on the floor, all buckled up. I lost <laughs> 12 pounds. I got on the, you know, 17 pounds I lost in that game. Mm-hmm. And that, that, for even for me, that was, uh, you know, I used to be able to fluctuate 10, 12 pounds and, and not get too too revved up about it. I could do that. I could balance my weight that well, carrying that much water weight. But when you start getting over 15 in, in four hours or five hours, uh, you're starting things, there's starting to be some chemical imbalances in there that go along with that. <laughs> and I we, did not feel real speak, good. I had a roaring headache for about a day. Oh, I, can, I can't even imagine. And we talked about at the beginning of the Legends and Legends podcast with Larry Zonko, we talked about Dolphins players uh, who have Zonk's teammates who have passed, but the NFL just lost Lynn Dawson, who is a graduate of Purdue University, much, excuse me, exactly like Bob Greasy. And Lynn Dawson said that was the best Chiefs team he had played on, that they thought they had it all. And to lose that game was, at home was particularly heartbreaking. Yes, that was uh, – and – just by the flip of a coin. I mean, think about how, you know, how many times it, <laughs> it could have been the last play of the game for them uh, with us losing, but it, it didn't work out that way. It just came down to us and that's, but it just kept going on and on and on. And I don't, <laughs> this was not a game of uh, we'll throw a pass, you throw a pass. This was a game of we were working the ball down the field. They were working, taking it back and working it down the field. It was an all-out ass-busting deal, and uh, nobody was backing off. And I'll tell you, like I said, I think everyone, including some of the cheerleaders, were glad that it was over. <laughs> I should say the Dolphins' victory was set up by a very long run by Larry Zonka, set up, of course, by his offensive line. Uh, I have uh, you have won so many accolades. Uh, I, I promised. I promised my brother as much as I was going to stick it to him that the Dolphins beat the Vikings in Super Bowl eight, that I would ask one question on his behalf, which is funny because I was thinking of it as well. But you have won so many accolades, comeback player of the year, Super Bowl MVP, All-American at Syracuse, Pro Bowl, All-Pro, Hall of Famer. How the hell did you not win an Oscar for Midway? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I've never been in a situation where I felt more out of place. <laughs> but, but I am not an actor. I boy, I you know, I thought Bert and some of the other guys I knew, Steve, Lee, a bunch of them were Zonk. You got the bullshit. You can do it. You know, you just got to be a different. I cannot, it's just hard for me to, uh, well, it's hard for me when football is such a reality, all right, to be able to take the reality and create another reality that's fictitious uh, to act and be sincere about it, um, 
it's like a guy thinking that he'll become tough if he acts tough. You know, <laughs> the guy that you know this from the military, the guy that acts the toughest, that drags his lip, sticks his lip out the furthest, and drags his feet the most. He's putting on a show to impress everybody. And you know, as soon as you see that guy, that this guy, he doesn't have, it's the guy that kind of grins and just ducks his head and takes his half cup coffee and sits down. He don't get real pissed <laughs> off over anything. He just, but you screw with that guy. You know, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. That's the, that's the difference in that. Well, you, you were around in football, you're around all these stars, whether it's, you know, Don Shula or John Madden, Ray Nitschke, Dick Buckus, Mean Joe Green, the players from your own team. But now you're in Midway, one of the greatest war movies of all time. If it, if you haven't seen it, that's forgive me, it's much better than the uh, newer version. But you're around Henry Fonda, Glenn Ford, Charlton Heston. Uh, Robert Mitchum is in the movie. I mean, all these incredible stars. What was it like being around them? I imagine they were pretty. Uh, I think it comes was, through in your book. I was quite. um nervous about being around them in their arena. But what was great was about two thirds of the people that you just alluded to are great football fans. They love to bet on football. And they started talking to me just the same way you, we started reliving all the past of the different games where they won when they bet on the dolphins and where they lost when they did. And just talking <laughs> about it because they're all, that's a, that's like a byline for a lot of Americans. Uh, when we get together, if we have nothing else to talk about, if we disagree on politics and all the other things we disagree on, but we start talking about football, <laughs> football, particularly because most American males and some females have played or been involved with it on a, on a pursuant fan basis or activity basis of being involved in the, in the team from junior high or, you know, grammar school from about sixth grade on. Now with Pee Wee and all the things that are going on, people are involved with even much more. So there's an identity there. And what's funny is I'm a terrible actor. And those guys that you alluded to are all sensational actors. They're the top, you know, that's the cream of the crop. And there I am, a toad sitting in the middle of them. <laughs> and they're asking me all about football, <laughs> making me feel all these, and we're laughing and talking. And then it comes time to act, and I'm trying to, and they're trying to help me. <laughs> Can you imagine some of the people you alluded to were telling me here, do it this way, Zonk, you know, think in your mind this and, and giving me little insights so that I could get that little one line thing or little thing that I had to do down. When you got Henry Fonda coaching you on how to act, you, you've been to the wall, you know, my acting <laughs> career was there and it was gone, but I was so tickled because of the fellas you talked about right there that were involved in it, that were around, that I was around and they were helping coach me on the thing. I feel like I was in I was in that arena for one time. It only took one play or two plays. That's fine. I don't care. But I got to be in that arena and see how much they liked what, you know, how much they enjoyed football. And that football, <laughs> what a great American game. What a great, what a come together thing, particularly in a time right now. That's uh, I, I try to push that in the book. I don't care what your political situation is. When you go to a football game and we've got our high school or our junior high boys and girls all involved in it, cheerleading and, and pep, pep rallies and the things, it's an American tradition that helps us become better Americans. And I believe that about the game. It's, uh, you know, it's like Shula with the integrity. If we, if, we, if we can't beat them straight up, then we won't. And we didn't. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's it. That thing we talked about right there, that's it. And when you when you walk out on that field after your arch rival just kicked your butt and finally won it in the closing seconds of overtime, one second, and you shake hands with them, what's more American than that? That overcome well, all the differences. That's where we're at. That's where we need to concentrate, you know. Well, that led me exactly to my last question before we get to the five questions that we ask all our guests. But I would say that you're, you're downplaying your acting skills because in the movie Midway, when you say that the boiler's out and can't be relit, I believed you as a kid in the movie theater, nine years old. It's like <laughs> Zonka says the boiler's out. I believe the boiler's out. <laughs> 40 years after the perfect season, I think roughly 40 years, 
1972 Dolphins finally got their visit to the White House. Uh, after you had won the Super Bowl in 73, President Nixon had other problems. He was also a Redskins fan, so I'm sure he wasn't in a hurry to shake uh, the hand of the of the Miami Dolphins who had just beat his team. I've watched the ceremony more than once uh, of when President Obama honored the Dolphins. You just talked about politics and football bridging that gap. What was that experience like? Because it looked absolutely wonderful just watching it on YouTube. It was a very positive experience. I've always wondered what it'd be like to be in the Oval Office or down, you know, in the White House there. It was a trip just to be there and actually walk on those floors and and visit and sit in that room, right? You know, that big hallway adjacent room there where we all all got together right off the, uh, not far from the Oval Office. To be in that scenario and just walk through there and uh, be able to stand there with the president at the time was a real thrill. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> you, you talk about, you know, we, we take being an American kind of natural for granted. And then sometimes something will happen. One moment will happen where you just stand in there and you think, damn, all this I've heard about, it's not a dream. It, it's really mm-hmm. happened. We started, you know, we back in, 1776 when we picked up that first stone and said no damn it we're you know this is it <laughs> we're going to be our own entity and we've done that i uh, just take tremendous pride in that and I, I you know that's when i earlier when i identified football as being very american it it's also very canadian uh, it's you know it's it's that camaraderie that you get in teamwork where you know, it's it's a Western kind of game, but at the same time, soccer, all the other games, it's that same thing where you really pull together as a team. And that teamwork, you know, with your military background, what I'm driving at, that's what it takes. When we believe in each other, we can be different poles, you know, we can disagree on a lot of things. But when push comes to shove, buddy, when we decide, well, screw all that stuff we're arguing about, we got something, we got a bigger we here and we're going to deal right. with it. Well, buddy, look out. That's I take tremendous pride in that, and that's that's the essence of teamwork. Gets close to being patriotic, you know, of being part of something that's so much bigger than you. But you're still an intricate piece, no matter how small you are. You're still an intricate piece. And when we decide to do something, when we finally get all, all our shit together and go the right <laughs> way, buddy, look out. My favorite part of that ceremony was when uh, President Obama alluded to the 85 Bears losing their undefeated seat to the Dolphins, and he couldn't even get the sentence out before Coach Shula goes, yeah, well, who beat him? <laughs> Shula really liked Obama, too, and he, but he just couldn't. <laughs> he can't. Shula, Shula. And uh I've been in his office many times. He used to say when we walked in, how you read it, the book, you walk in this door and close this door. You can say anything you want to say, you know, in front of the team, you will address me as coach. And you, you know, the military background, what he's driving at. That's the only way it's yes, going to work. You got it. You got it. There's going to be one guy in charge and that's him. But I got so tickled at him when he was talking about that. He, he's well, that's it. He that's couldn't help himself. Yep. He just didn't. You know, he when he first saw him, he's walking up, he saluted him, you know, the president, mm-hmm. he saluted him. And, and you could see that he liked him when he shook hands and he respected the office, what it was, what it was about. But when you go back to that football and jump on him in his backyard, it'll pop out of him in just a second. You know, <laughs> you know who beat him? <laughs> there you go. Oh, that's classic. Uh, we've reached the point in this very special Leaders and Legends podcast with one of the greatest NFL legends of all time, Hall of Fame and all pro fullback for the Miami Dolphins. And I guess we should say the New York Giants for a time. Larry Zonka, uh, where we ask the same five questions of all of our guests. So Zonk, number one, what was your first job? The first job, well, after you put that question to me, I thought about it a little bit. I was eight years old. And my brothers and sisters and I all picked strawberries on the farm. And I was elected the guy that would go and sell them in front of the hardware in the town. And I made a few cents for every quart that I sold out there off of each of my brothers and sisters. And I would set up with my two crates of strawberries in front of the uh, hardware across the street from the uh, 
uh, funeral home and people would pull into the, the parking <laughs> lot and buy the strawberries. And I was uh, an entrepreneur and uh, got to put strawberries in the back of people's cars and, and uh, you know, set them in the back seats and take money and make change. And I thought, this is great. And that's uh, it's my first farming experience where I actually made cash, where I actually made money. <laughs> we had three acres of strawberries, and I don't want to even get into what it takes. Anybody out there that grows strawberries knows what it takes. So my mother wanted a few strawberries to make jam with. Dad put in three acres. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's worked our butts off on it. But we picked up enough money to buy school clothes and do different things. And uh, my sister bought a horse with that money that she earned from selling strawberries one year. Yeah, great memories. Number two, what was your first concert? Now, I'm a farm boy, and I don't go to many concerts. I'll tell you right up front. I don't know much of that. But my roommate, Jim Kick, always had the record play, always had a stereo going in the room, always was listening to stuff. And he made me go with him, and I'm glad he did, to Loggins and Messina back in 75, 76. I think we were over in Nashville or something. I don't remember where we were at. And we were playing for Memphis, I think, or getting ready to in the uh, old mm-hmm. World Football League. And we had just got there and he had tickets to go. And I went with him to a Loggins and Messina concert and really enjoyed it. I really, it was a good, good time. Number three, we should also mention Jim Kick had a musical uh, artist uh, who he hustled at pool. And his name was Elvis Presley. <laughs> yeah. I watched the two of them argue over eight ball <laughs> in the bottom of Elvis's house there in Memphis. That was, I'll tell you what, that there were, that I wish I had a movie. I wish I would have taken a video <laughs> a video of that because people wouldn't believe it. Elvis is one funny, funny dude, and so was Jim Kick. They really enjoyed each other's company. Great people, both of them. Uh, number three, if you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? I would recommend a book called North of the Sun. It was written by Fred Hatfield. And it's a his memoir about Alaska. When I grew up, to give you my background and why I said that, again, North of the Sun is the name of the book. If anyone out there has a yin, a drawing to Alaska that they can't explain, that they just want to go and see it, or they just feel an an attachment to it, as many of us do, read that book before you go, because it tells you the places. Years ago, I read that book, and I aspired to get there. And when I got there, I wanted to to do an outdoor, I wanted to stay there. And the way I could stay there was to do an outdoor hunting and fishing show and go to those places that that Fred talked about in the in that book. And I did that. And I'm hoping sometime down the road, maybe another few, another year or two, to write a book about going there and seeing what he had seen years and years before, 50 years before. Now, it would be fun to do that, but that's the one I would suggest. And that's part of you. And it's a great quote in your book, part of you and, and Audrey Bradshaw making your vocation your vacation. Terrific quote. Mm-hmm. Number four, if you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? Declaration of Independence. I would give anything. I, you read about it. You, I see you smiling when we're looking at each other on this Zoom. You know what I'm talking about. You can't be an American and really love this country. And you think about those sassy little brats <laughs> saying, hey, we've had enough. We're on our own here. We're going to make our own country and we're going to do it the right way. I would love to have been there. And, uh, you know, obviously you would love to have been able to sign it. But it, just to be there to see it happen. Um that would that would be my choice. That is the most popular choice of all my guests on the Leaders on Legends podcast. It's a signature moment in world history for sure. Last question for Hall of Famer Larry Zonka. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, living today, two hours off the record, just to chat, whom would you choose? I'll answer this this way. I thought about that for years. If I could have dinner with one person, I really like to enjoy. And and for years, I, I always came up with Chuck Yeager. I grew up in Ohio, country boy. He was, you know, grew up in Virginia. 
as a country boy. And he was the guy that took the plane and flew it in into low orbit. He flew it into, into space, drifted back in and almost died doing it. So he was the first true astronaut or first guy that went to space. And I got to meet him and hunt with him in Texas and New Mexico oh. and down in Mexico. He had a plane he'd rented in in Texas, and we flew down to Mexico, went duck hunting together, and I listened to him blow by blow, reiterate what he did that day and how it, how it all happened, and I was mesmerized. Now, to answer your question, any astronaut that has been outside the orbital path, in other words, anyone that's gone out into space and come back, you know, obviously, you, you think of all the people that have been out there that walked on the moon, Armstrong, the people that were there, but they're gone. But any of them that have been up to the space station and been in orbit and looked and seen, they've seen things and, and witnessed things, the beauty of outer space. I'm, I'm very excited about what's happening now. And it looks like we're going to get the program back on track and go again. I'm excited about that. Someday, if I live long enough and hold up, I would uh, I'd love to go out and look at the moon and see it the way uh, people like Chuck Yeager saw it. Um, it would be nice to sit down with someone that's done that. that has been up in the space station and and just tell you about their itinerary and what they did. And then opening that side window and looking at the moon without any obstruction, with no atmosphere between you, just to gaze at it. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really cool. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Our guest today in I'm not going to lie. It really is a dream come true. Larry Zonka, NFL Hall of Famer, number 39 for my Miami Dolphins, my all-time favorite player. Zonk, I can't thank you enough for your time. I'm going to uh, be thinking about this to be candid for the rest of my life. I'm very grateful. Good. If you're ever down this way in North Carolina or Florida, holler at me. Maybe we can go have lunch sometime. I'd sure enjoy telling you some off the cuff stories. <laughs> I would, I would definitely enjoy that. And Jacqueline, you get to come too. There you Thank go. you, Zonk. See you later. Thank you very much for listening to leaders and legends brought to you by veteran strategies incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at Robert at veteran strategies.com. That's Robert at veteranstrategies.com. Strategies.com.